This is lecture number 26, E313 Signals and Systems. I'm Professor Robert Heath. Uh, this is going to be the last lecture of the semester. So today, in this final lecture, we're going to go through an introduction to the Z-transform. So I'm going to define the, the Z-transform and establish the regions of convergence. We'll look at a couple of uh, Z-transform pairs where we compute the Z-transform for several common sequences, and then we'll wrap up with a summary of the properties. And so we're just going to cover 10.1, 10.2, and 10.5 of the Oppenheim and Wilski book. So let's start off with the Z-transform fundamentals. So in this section, you want to be able to calculate the Z-transform of a discrete time sequence and determine its region of convergence. So the motivation here starts for the, the, the story about eigenfunctions. So recall that if we have a discrete time system, h of n, that if we input a sequence z to the n, the output is h of z times z to the n. And it should be clear that h of n is a linear time invariant system. And z of n is called the eigenfunction. And h of z, which is a complex number, is the eigenvalue. And this is the z-transform, which is the sum from minus infinity to infinity, h of n, z to the minus n. And z is a complex number. The values of z where the sum converges is known as the region of convergence. And so we saw the same concept in the Laplace transform, except the, re the region of convergence was the values of s where the integral converged. So let's look first at an example here of a Z-transform. This is a, a causal sequence a to the n u of n. Now remember that we saw these kinds of Z-transforms when we did uh, discrete time uh, linear constant coefficient difference equations. So let's determine its Z-transform. Well, we're going to plug it into the Z-transform equation and then do the following computation. So we've, we substitute in a to the n u of n z to the minus n we you know, get rid of the unit step and use the finite sum formula to get 1 over 1 minus 8 over z. And we can apply the finite sum formula supposing that the absolute value of a over z is less than 1. Otherwise, it's infinity. And so rewriting, we often rewrite the z-transform in terms of z to the minus 1. We get 1 over 1 minus a, z to the minus 1, and the region of convergence is z greater than a. And so the, the main difference between the Laplace transform and the Z-transform, in my opinion, is, is the shape of the re region of convergence. And so here, the region of convergence for the Z-transform is, deter is determined by the modulus of Z. And so in this example, modulus of Z being greater than modulus of A, you see that the region of convergence is the entire plane, but is missing a hole. And that hole has radius of absolute value of A. So let's look at an anti-causal sequence. So if you take that anti-causal sequence X of N minus A to the N U of minus N and substitute into the Z transform and then simplify. So we substitute in, get rid of the unit step function, we get some from n equals 1 to infinity, z over a to the n. And then, now to apply the finite sum formula, we want to have a sum that starts at 0. So what we do is we get rid of the, um, we get rid of the a here. Sorry, we, we, add, we add and subtract 1 because z over a to the power of 0 is 1. And this is minus, so that's a minus 1. So we add a 1 here. So now we can use the finite sum formula on this term and we get 1 over minus 1 over 1 over minus z to the a, which is a over z minus a plus 1, which is a plus z minus z over z minus a, or z over z minus a, or 1 over 1 minus a z minus 1, which is exactly what we got before, except that the region of convergence is now z less than modulus of a. So the region of convergence here is, is a disk. So before it was the whole plane with a hole in it, now it's a disk, 
And they, so they have the same analytical expression, but different region of convergence, and this corresponds to two different sequences. So this sequence here is anti-causal because the unit step is going in the left direction. And then this sequence is causal because the unit step is going in the right direction. So in general, the region of convergence um, that we consider in the class is only a few possibilities. It can be the entire z-plane, a hole, a donut, or a disk. And so the donut is the equivalent to the strip in the Laplace transform. So it's the region of convergence is bounded by two values. The hole is greater than some value. The disk is less than some value. So the hole corresponds to causal sequences, the disk anti-causal sequences, and the donut mixtures of the two sequences. And so this is two important facts. First of all, if a sequence is causal, it has in what we call a right-sided region of convergence, really we mean outward. So it's a, a hole, or the whole or the entire plane. And a causal and stable sequence has a region of convergence that includes the unit circle. And so the unit circle is the place where z is equal to e to the j omega, and that's also the place where the DTFT exists. So here's the connection of the DTFT. So remember the DTFT was the sum from minus infinity to infinity x of n e to the minus j omega n. We wrote that as x e to the j omega. So if the z transform, if the region of convergence includes the unit circle, then we can compute the DTFT by evaluating the z transform at e to the j omega. And so in general, um, you can find the, the DTFT from the Z-transform, except for certain special signals like periodic signals that, um, that had defined transforms involving the direct delta function. So to summarize, the Z-transform is the sum from minus infinity to infinity, x of n, z to the minus n. We write that as x of z. The discrete time Fourier transform is x, z to the j omega, sum from minus n equals minus n to infinity to infinity x of n e to the minus j omega n. If the region of convergence includes the unit circle, then x e to the j omega equals x of z, z equal at e to the j omega. I'm going to go through a few z-transform pairs. So we need to determine the common z-transform pairs and then illustrate regions of convergence here. So here's a, a delta function. So let's insert that into the z-transform expression. And remembering the sifting property here, this sum is non zero only for the place where n is equal to zero, and that corresponds to one. And so um, the z transform of a delta is a one. Now let's look at a time shifted delta. So we delay the delta by a constant m. So substituting in using the sifting property, factoring out z to the minus m gives us x equals x is equals z to the minus m. And so in this case, the z transform corresponds to of, of a delta function shifted by m corresponds to a z to the minus m. And so if you imagine that this delta is the impulse response of an LTI system, then what the system would do would be to delay the input by m. And we see that um, the corresponding system is written z to the minus m. And so a lot of times in block diagram form, you'll see z to the minus m used to denote a system that delays the input. So let's look at the z transform of the unit step. This is just a special case of what we already did with a is equal to one. So substituting x of z is one over one minus c inverse, absolute value of z greater than one. And so it doesn't include the unit circle. Let's look at a right-sided complex sinusoid. So we have e to the j omega n u of n, determinants region of convergence. So this is also a special case of what we did before. And its z transform is just z over z minus e to the j omega, or one over one minus z inverse e to the j omega. Region of convergence z greater than one. Uh, here is a more complicated sinusoid 
So what we do here is we have a cosine, so we apply Euler's to it. And so we decompose the sinusoid to write to be one half to the n times one half e to the j ten n plus e to the minus j ten n. And splitting it, we get something to the n, something to the um, the conjugate of that to the n u of n, and we can apply the previous result to it. And so you know, we can write the z transform substituting is x of z four z squared minus two cos ten of z four z squared minus four z plus one. And we can also write this in the delay form. I'm just writing this with the z squared here. And then, now what are the zeros and the poles here? So just like with the Laplace transform, the, the, zeros of the, num the zeros of the numerator are called zeros of the transfer function. The zeros of the denominator are called poles. And so substituting in here, we find that uh, the zeros are at zero, let's see, minus um, 0 0.42, and then the poles at uh, plus minus one half e to the j uh, 10. And so plotting it, the region of convergence is it's a causal sequence. So it is this half plane with a hole. The magnitude is one half. So we have the one half to the end here. And then the two zeros are located here, and the two poles are located here, which in this case is approximately 3.18 um, pi. And so this is the first one, this is the second one here. And so since the region of convergence is greater than one half, this Z transform would correspond to a stable LTI system, and you could find the Z transform by plugging in um, to the region of convergence here. Plug, sorry, plugging into the Z-transform. Okay, so now let's look at another example. So suppose that we have um, a signal that's composed of one, two, three, four delta functions, and a zero here, so it's like five deltas. And we compute its region of convergence. So this is gonna to correspond to one, this to Z to the minus two, this to minus one half Z to the minus three, and two Z to the minus four. So you can compute the Z transform directly just from the properties of the delta function. So you see it's one plus C inverse. So if you see a Z transform like this, you know it corresponds to a finite length signal. And finding the Z transform is very easy. So here are some Z transform pairs. These are the most common ones, and these are the ones, all the ones that we've done in the lecture here. You can see delta, unit step, minus unit step, shifted delta, alpha, alpha to the minus n, and you can see the region of convergence, all the z's here that we have considered. And then here are some less common ones that it's just useful to have in the table form, but you can see the cosine, the sine, r to the n, cosine, r to the n sine here. And these are all the respective transforms here. And then these are those respective transforms. So these are transforms that you, know, you would be provided in the exam and you might need to use on uh, the final. So I'm going to conclude the lecture today with a discussion of some Z transform properties. I'm going to enumerate some of the properties and use those to solve the Z transforms for more complicated uh, systems. So why do we use the properties? Well, same reason we always do. It's just to avoid having to do the brute force calculation. And the, the properties are very similar to what we've already done with the DTFT. So the only thing is just to pay attention to what happens to the region of convergence. And so this you'll need from table 10. This is, that summarizes the properties. So recall that you know, if we have a left or right shift, this becomes a delta function here. Sorry, the delta becomes e to the minus m times a constant. So for general signals, if we shift the n by m, then that corresponds to multiplying the Z transform by Z to the minus M. And the reason it just comes from a change of variables, similarly advancing the signal gives us a factor of Z to the M on the positive side. And so as a result here, uh, as I mentioned this before, we often um, denote that a delay as Z to the minus one. And so if you have a system that takes X of N, 
delays it by one, the output would be x of n minus one. We might write z to the minus one here instead of delta to the n minus one. And if you look at um, a lot of system block diagrams, especially if you take 351m or 445s, you'll use this, this z, no, z notation quite commonly. So this probably won't be a surprise, but uh, convolution in time is multiplication in the z domain. We saw a similar effect to the DTFT, as well as with the Fourier and Laplace transforms. And so if you have x of n and h of n, you need to compute the convolution. You could do the product in the z domain and go back to the time domain. And then the transfer function of h of z can be determined by the ratio of y of z and, and x of z. And then the important thing to note is that the, what happens to the region of convergence here. So the region of convergence is at least the intersection of the separate regions of convergence, respectively. And so, um, and that makes sense because you need that the values of z where this converges, it has to be the values of z where x1 converges and the values of z where x2 converges. Now it's possible you could have a cancellation and the region of convergence could be larger, but the region of convergence won't be smaller than the intersection of the two. So there's also conjugate symmetry. So if you take the conjugate of the signal, take a z-transform that's equivalent to conjugating the z-transform of the signal and conjugating the z. That has the same region of convergence. And then for real signals, the poles of xz have to be complex conjugates. And so if you take x of z, you take its conjugate here, then, and this is real, then these guys both have to be complex conjugates. So here's just a summary of the, the properties. Most of these properties are what we've seen before in the class. So scaling, multiplication, I didn't go over these, but, but this is the other one that's important here. So z over z naught scales the region convergence by z naught. We multiply by a to the nx of n. We get xa inverse to z scaling z here, the z transform. The conjugation convolution, this is a difference. You can see just by taking the z-transform, this should be one minus the inverse. The accumulation is interesting. And that's the main ones here. We don't need any other properties for, for the course at this point. So just do a couple examples with the properties. So consider a signal one-fifth to the n u of n minus three. So let's evaluate its z-transform and specify its region of convergence. Now this looks very similar to something we have in the table, except that we have a unit step of n minus three here. And so if we can write this in terms of n minus three, we can use the time shifting property. So that's gonna be the strategy here. So let's look at that here. So we write this, we get rid of the unit step. Well, this in this example, this is the brute force calculation. Um, so they just go through and, and plug it in, but um, you could have just used the uh, the direct the direct approach, which would have been to factor out the n minus three and use the unit step. So the second one here, we have a sum of of two signals here. We're going to determine the constraints on the complex number alpha and integer n naught given the region of convergence of x of z is one less than absolute value of z less than two. So by using this equation here, we can see that alpha and then u of minus n minus n naught is minus z to the minus n naught over one minus a z inverse. And then um, using linearity, we obtain the sum. And so we see that there's um, this region of convergence z less than alpha. And so the constraint to make the region of convergence between one and two means that alpha should be two and then n naught doesn't affect the region of convergence, so it can actually be anything. Here's example three. So determine the z-transform of the following sequence, sketch the poles and zeros, and determine its region of convergence. So we have um, a difference here between two unit step functions. So the easiest approach would be to recognize that this difference between two unit steps is just a bunch of impulses. And so therefore we can write this as, as follows. And then we can also rewrite this using the finite sum formula as 
1 half to the minus 4 is e to the 4 over the, the following sum here. So this, this is interesting because you know, the region of convergence is um, you know, the entire z-plane, and it has four zeros at zero and eight zeros distributed on a, a circle of radius one-half. So you don't necessarily see all the poles and zeros directly when you look at this equation. You have to write it in terms of a ratio of two polynomials. So this is, this is a kind of a classic example here to show the, the zeros of a finite length signal. And then you also get that the Fourier transform exists here. Well, that's it. It's a short lecture. Um, to just to summarize, the Z transform is the equivalent of the Laplace transform. It has a region of convergence. The region of convergence is a disk or a plane with a hole or a donut or is the entire plane. And we use it to analyze the discrete time systems. And so from this lecture, you should be able to calculate the Z transform directly, use, it, use the region of convergence, and then you should also be able to apply the, the transforms and properties to, to basic problems. So that's it. Uh, I enjoyed the class and good.